Good evening. Welcome to our city council meeting for the first of the year. Happy, happy new year, happy 2020. Um, call the meeting to order. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Roll call, please. Mayor Ortega? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Lauer? Here. Council Member Thompson? Here. Council Member Estes? Here. Council Member Geek? Here. Council Member Duncan? Here. Council Member Applegate? Here. Seven members present? Okay. Um, I trust everyone had a good Christmas and, and New Year's and holiday, and uh, glad to see everybody back. And we're hoping for another really good year coming up. So. Um, let's go ahead and get started with our business for 2020. Here we go. Um, item four, presentations. We have none. Item four B, board commission committee appointments. Are you all right? Okay. I can. Oh. Okay. Not okay. Okay. So you got to say first. Uh, we're going to do a commission uh, appointment for. Um, Planning Commission, we're going to appoint a regular member. Um. Oh. Okay. Um, I have to recuse myself because I know the person that's being appointed. So. Okay. And do we have to take a motion on anything, or he can just recuse no, himself? Okay. All right. Um, and who's speaking about this one? Oh, okay. Sorry. So. Uh, as Ms. Duncan was uh, elected to City Council, that left a regular uh, member vacancy on the Planning Commission. The uh, vacancy was advertised in the Fountain Valley News for three consecutive weeks, at which point the city received one application from a Mr. Corey Applegate. Um, Mr. Applegate was not able to attend tonight's meeting, so he did provide a written statement um, thanking City Council uh, to consider for considering his application based on his knowledge of building and construction and within the community. Um, there were no other applications received for um, this application or this okay. appointment. And is this the only position that's open right now? Correct. Okay. All right. I think some of us already know Corey, um, uh, mainly because of his dad, but uh, he's been a part of some other organizations here in town that he, he does some volunteer work for. So um, what would council like to do with this appointment? Mr. Geek. I move to approve Corey Applegate on the planning commission. And Mr. Lauer? I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for approval. Please vote. I have six yes, motion carried. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we'll move on to item five, City Council agenda requests and announcements. I'll start with uh, Ms. Duncan. If I need to come back to you, I can't, because I know you, you kind of just came in, so. The traffic is really heavy. So yeah. attended the Fountain Valley Clean Water Coalition meeting. Um, they had over 40 people at this meeting. And um, one of the things that they did say that they will choose 400 people randomly to participate and give blood and urine samples. So I did talk with um, Scott and ask him, you know, um, how can you get this information to the council meeting, so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, on Saturday, December 21st, I attended the Blue and Red Santa at the Beckett Center. That was a great event held by our police department. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it. I could have stayed there the whole entire time. It was really great. And we are in the process <coughs> of doing a, um, there will be, um, a Mark, a MLK event. I'm sure that um, some people got the flyer that was listed coming up on Monday at one o'clock. Where at? The, at the, um, Dean Plashauer Center. What's that, Dean Plashauer? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's, it should be posted. It was. Um, There's a. 
put it on the front door too. Okay, so it's on the front door. So I'll, I'll send it out to the council members to okay. let you know. Because it would be nice for the council to show up. Um, we've had a lot of interest in uh, a lot of calls today since it's been publicized since yesterday. Because there's an event that's held at Colorado College and it, the tickets are sold out. So they're looking for places to go. Okay. All right, one o'clock at the Dean Fletcher Activity Center. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Anything else? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Geek, anything? Uh, Mr. Applegate? Nothing tonight. Ms. Estes? Um, the Fountain Valley Historical Society had their first in their winter lecture series this last Saturday. 46 people were in attendance. We thank you for everybody that came out for that. Our next in the series will be February 8th over at the museum, and the topic will be part one of the Families of Fountain. So, and our city clerk's family will be represented that day, so I hope we all see you all there. Oh. Two o'clock. All right, thank you. Uh, Mayor Portem, anything? Yeah, tomorrow we'll be here at, uh, from 2 to 3.30. There's a, uh, what they're calling a stakeholders meeting, the first in a series of many stakeholders meetings. Um, and I'll just kind of read briefly from what's going on here from the email that we got. Uh, the Fountain Creek Watershed Flood Control and Greenway District would like to invite you to participate in a meeting to discuss the Fountain Creek Corridor Greenway Master Plan Project. The district has recently been awarded grants from GOCO and some others to identify the final alignment of the Front Range Trail from Colorado Springs to Pueblo, which is a 46-mile stretch that encompasses some of the healthiest river corridor in Colorado, and much of that is privately owned. Because of the private ownership, um, that introduces the need for um, a really, really robust stakeholder process. Uh, so they're going to kick that off with a meeting tomorrow. THK Associates is our design engineering firm for the district for that particular project. They're going to be presenting sort of their preliminary information to this point and then seeking feedback from community and especially the, the property owners along that corridor. Uh, but the Fountain Creek District is uh, pretty much the project manager of record for that entire 46-mile stretch and trying to balance a trail that's going to last 15 to 20 years minimum with minimal maintenance and balance that with uh, the rights of the property owners is is the the key thing that we're working on as the district right now so if you didn't see anything about that um, <coughs> on behalf of the district i'll apologize for that thk scheduled a meeting kind of at the last minute because they were trying to get as many of the property owners to say yes they'd be here as they could and they got the last one to say yes at the last minute uh, it'll be at two o'clock from two to three thirty right here in, in council chambers tomorrow so if you didn't hear about that feel free to come in and at least see what thk is going to present as kind of a prelim preliminary information about that that's all i've got okay uh, Ms. thompson anything yeah i'll do my best to be in two places at once. <laughs> um, Dietra, the freeway is backed up, and so everybody's drum dumping off onto 85, and it took it took me almost 30 minutes to get here with a normal five-minute drive. So, yeah, so hopefully it'll clear up pretty soon, because you know how that is went down here once that starts. Um, okay, the um, um, state has begun back last week. The legislators are back in session. And so Scott and I listened to a CML web webinar, webinar, and um, and that was very interesting. They talked about a lot of bills they don't necessarily have bill numbers for. And then Monday with PPACG, um, I'm on the legislative panel there. We had our first meeting, and so PPACG has their own lobbyist that we hired last a couple years ago, and she did have some bill numbers for us. So um, Greg, if you would pass these down. Um, I went ahead and made up a short um, list of some of the things we're looking at yet. I think they said 175 bills were dropped the first day. Um, each legislator can put in five bills, not counting any late bills. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so hang on. If you hear of anything that sounds interesting nationally or <coughs> statewide, please let me know and we can follow through on it. PPCG, our lobbyists, we follow up on five bills have to do with military, um, air, water, transportation, and aging. So those are the bills we follow through there. However, starting this year, we're gonna be making a separate list of unfunded mandate bills that might not have anything to do with those five pillars, 
but they might have to do with municipalities or county governments, so we're gonna be watching out for those bills too. Um, we do have a sample letter we're putting together that I'm gonna bring the council um, at the latest, probably the next meeting, that we're trying to get every city and county government to put a letter to the state legislators uh, talking about unfunded mandates, uh, that they, they just really can't be coming down, that we, don't have, we just don't have the money for them. Um, there's at least one family leave bill that we're aware of and possibly a second one coming and um, so just a lot of stuff going on so there's a summary for you so i don't take a lot of time but if you have any questions send me an email give me a call do you have an extra one? i sure do yep and um be happy to answer any questions or research it and um it, hang on it's gonna be interesting yeah yeah and then also, if you've been a Mesa Ridge Parkway, you may have seen that the county has begun working on the pond restoring. Brandy, do you know anything about that? The no, no, right, the pond's right there off Mesa Ridge Parkway. You're not on. Wilson Ponds? Willow Springs Pond, yeah. So if you go there, you're not gonna be able to hike around out there. It's really trenched out and dug and neither, whatever they're gonna be doing there, they have begun. Right. You're not on, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> you literally can't hear anything um, yeah. on, on YouTube if you're not on. They're uh, reinforcing that berm, putting in pylons to make sure that the next storm does not go into the ponds. So, um, but the trails around it will be shut down until they get done. So the trails around it are shut down, yeah, yeah, okay. So it looks, when you drive over it, if you kind of look on the south side, if you're heading east on Mesa Ridge Parkway, you can see the big mess they've made down there. But um, that's an effort to save the pond. Otherwise, the next major storm we have, we may not have a pond. So just be patient with them while they're doing that. We've been waiting for 10 years anyway, so. Um, I don't yeah. know if it was quite 10 years, but close enough. Um, anything else? I think that's enough. Okay. Um, the only thing, uh, so I'm meeting, I'm going to go to that meeting too, Greg, I was invited to that, so, um, and uh, I've also got a mayor's meeting tomorrow, so Mayor Southers is hosting us uh, uh, up at his office tomorrow for lunch, um, and then next week, I mentioned this back in December, um, I was asked, there's a, it's a, out of University of Wisconsin, I think it is, it's a mayor's innovation project, and they um, put on conferences throughout the the, the country and and they just talk about different things that are uh, cities are, are dealing with and so um, they actually reached out to me and really like what we're doing with communities that care and all the work that's gone into that and and the partnership that we've gotten with them and and granted they're they're kind of the ones that do most of the work with the things that we have but I know they work with our PD and, and things like that to to do some of that so I'm gonna go out and just present how communities of care works with the city of Fountain and and how um, uh, the their targeted our targeted solutions are helping the broader good. So um, it's really kind of tying into the adolescent, um, it kind of starting with the adolescent uh, smoking and vaping, and and how it's uh, moved um, into more of the mental health issues and things like that, and and how um, much our city's been involved with that from the get-go across the county, and and uh, really the Fountain Valley has been kind of the 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 main source of all this work because uh, we're the only ones who've been responding so um, some good stuff coming out there so I'll be out in DC uh, presenting at that next next Friday so kind of a exciting deal to co kind of share our story here of Fountain and I'll be on a panel with two other mayors um, one from Grand Rapids and the other one is from North Carolina and so um, the North Carolina guy I'm thinking well Sharon would like this one because he they're they're setting up a, a tiny home village in their uh, community um, and uh, and so he's going to be talking about that, and I can't remember what the lady from uh, um, Grand Rapids is going to be talking about. Uh, it was all kind of fast and furious phone call to try to get our information in. So um, we'll see. It should be exciting. I don't know. Um, but they're paying for everything, so that's, that's even better. Um, we'll see. Okay, uh, and then there was something else I had in my head that I wanted to talk about. Oh, uh, council agendas. So um, over the course of the next year, uh, there are some ideas I want to um, kind of bring forward to our council and and uh, and reworking our agenda a little bit. I want to make it a little more efficient, um, a little more uh, um, business friendly in a sense that we're here to do city business and here to um, uh, take care of the things that we need to take care of as 
as we continue to grow and, and keep growing. Um, and so one of the first things we're going to um, look at is moving our proclamations, our recognitions, those types of things that usually take a bit of time at the beginning of our meeting. Um, we're looking at possibly moving those to um, once a month, and we'll do them at 530 right before our meeting, um, our regular meeting, I, and one Tuesday a month that we have our meetings um, to kind of make our regular meetings a little more efficient. So um, as we move forward, I don't know when we're going to implement that, but hopefully within the next month or two, we'll implement doing that. And um, uh, again, just to make it a little more efficient and people who want to be here just for that recognition or just for that proclamation, come in, listen to that. And then at six o'clock or 555, well, if you want to leave, you can leave. It doesn't interrupt and disrupt things. And we can start our normal meeting and really hope to cut down on. So, uh, we've been getting a lot lately and it's been taking up a good, you know, if we're honest 15 to 30, 45 minutes of of just those things so i'm thinking if we can be a little more efficient with that time and uh, a lot of uh, communities i've been looking at how they run their board meetings and, and their council meetings um, a lot of them do it this way and it's just uh, it's an easier way to kind of do that so when we want to do pictures and all that it's it's a little more of an informal part of that meeting and and then we'll get started right with our regular meeting at six so um just look for that and and uh, there's some other ideas i have kind of going in my head that i may want to um, throughout there eventually as well but that will be the first big one that that will change a little bit but again we gotta i think work through some just some things with uh, the city clerk's office and and ensuring we get that noticed properly and, and that but uh, i'm looking for that hopefully within the next month month and a half so uh, we'll see how that goes but other than that um, that's it for me we'll go right into our public to be heard uh, citizens may address the council on items that are not on our agenda um, we ask that you sign up with your clerk prior to the meeting. We have cards in the back. Um, council may not be able to provide an immediate answer, but would direct staff to follow up. And out of respect for the council and others in attendance, we ask that you um, limit your comments to three minutes or less. And right now I have one card, and it's Ms. Meininger. Please come forward. And again, I just want to remind, uh, if you come up, that we're going to try to get the lights on um, and just kind of keep you on, on task with the three minutes, and we'll go from there. Deborah Stout Meininger, Community Advocate, Citizen Scientist. I do hope that everyone had a nice holiday, Christmas and New Year's. And welcome to our new City Council members. I haven't had a chance to say that yet, but welcome. Puts the, the uh, hormone balance a little bit better here. Too much testosterone before. <laughs> anyway. Uh, one of the concerns that I've been looking at over the last few months, and I was down a little bit during the holidays because I managed to get one of those wonderful little flu bugs, so that kind of slowed my, my motors down a little bit. But during that time, I got to listen a lot more to the news and what's going on, and as well as when I'm always on the bus and at different places where I'm talking to people off and on, <coughs> both in here and Colorado Springs and other places in El Paso County, one of the things that knows no, no, rem no remedy yet, and goes on constantly, even during the, during the season when people should be in their homes and enjoying themselves with family, is the housing issue. The fact that we still have abysmal amounts of affordable housing, and the developments, unfortunately, do not actually add to the problem because so many of them destroy any affordable housing whether it's individual or older trailers or anything like that in their way to make all us grand homes and commercial sites and everything else that's not just in colorado springs that also happens way too often here in fountain over the last few years that's not supposed to be a remedy Affordable housing is something you build, not something you destroy and say, we're working on it. I tell that to Colorado Springs, and I'm saying that here because when people are getting evicted from apartment complexes that are just resold and being told, well, when they're done with that, all of that, then they can come back if they want to and apply for an apartment. And people are saying, oh, where are we going to find a two-bedroom apartment for $1,200, which I think is an atrocious amount of money for a two-bedroom apartment. These are not big, fancy places. These are just places to live. And people are worried where they're going to be living. 
This is adding to the homeless population, adding to the stress of two and three ha families living in one apartment or several families in one house. A lot of that is going on and it's being ignored. And then we have a governor who says to the, to the other Democrats, oh, hey, we're sanctuary state, so send up anybody you want that needs a home because we got lots of housing. Wow, I wonder where that money's coming from. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, again, I have no other cards. If anybody would like to speak on anything that's not on our agenda, please come forward. And state your name for the record. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Matt Lewis. I'm the junior vice of the uh, Newt Heisley American Legion Post 38. And um, I'd just like to let you guys know that we're open uh, 6685 Southmore Drive, Fountain, Colorado, 80817. We're right behind Walmart there. Um, we've got a few things going on this month. Um, this uh, Friday is the ALR Steak Dinner, American Legion Rider Steak Dinner. Uh, the 24th, we're having uh, a Legion host dinner. We're having pork chops that night. Um, and Every Thursday night, we have ladies' night and line dancing lessons and stuff. So we're teaching people how to dance and things like that. And next month, we've got a couple things going on, too. We've got a, our, our Valentine's dance. It's leather and lace. Um, and we also have uh, all our dinners on Friday nights. Okay. And that's all. Oh, it's open to the public and families. So we're public friendly. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Excuse me. Could you make sure that Joni or Scott or somebody has your contact information? Um, I do the Memorial Day and Veterans Day events, and I need to make sure you have your information so I can. Um, okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, we will. Continue plugging forward. Our uh, consent agenda is item number seven. Uh, all, all items listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be approved with one motion. Uh, there will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen requests, in which case the item may be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. At the discretion of the council, we have items, I think, A through F. Ms. Thompson. Move to approve consent agenda unless somebody wants to remove something. Uh, Ms. Estes. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second for approval. Please vote. Sorry. Six yes, motion, I'm sorry, seven yes, motion carried. Okay, she was staring at me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> item eight, old business, 8A, second reading of ordinance number 1743. An ordinance approving an overall development plan for Aspen Ranch, generally located east of Link Road and north of Kane Road, here and after more specifically described in Exhibit A and Exhibit B. Ms. Martinez. Thank you. Again, this is the second reading of uh, Ordinance 1743, which was for the overall development plan for um, Aspen Ranch. It was heard and approved on first reading on December 10th, 2019, and it was approved subject to four conditions that. Um, mainly focused on the open space, traffic impact fees, um, the responsibility of the construction of Link Road, and then the East Side Transmission Recovery Agreement. There was also some discussion during the first reading of the ordinance regarding um, a crosswalk at Link and Watchman. Um, after going back to the subject matter experts, um, the City Council can also reserve the right in the future that once Link Road is fully built out um, and if the traffic study comes back and those are warranted that that crosswalk can go back in if it's necessary. Um, at this point, Link Road is anticipated to be con through all the construction sometime next year, um, at which point we'll have a better idea as to what that full build out will look like and um, the travel speed on that road as well. So you're saying we can have the developer A then? Have okay. Put in the crosswalk at that so the, point, yes. The traffic study at that mm -hmm. point, okay. Otherwise, there were no uh, changes to the ordinance uh, since first reading. Do we need to add anything, or is that 
do we have to say that in our motion? You can add it as a condition. Um, you can also include it as the motion. Um, it will also be reviewed again during the preliminary plat, which goes before the planning commission if the traffic warrants are necessary at that point. Otherwise, um, there's other opportunities in the future that the city could go back and take a look at that intersection to determine if a crosswalk needs to be installed or not. Okay. Okay. Any questions from council? motion have to reserve the right to get a crosswalk later or is that just uh, understood? okay make sure your mic's on so uh mr obligate's asking if the motion has to have that condition <coughs> that's that right is that what i'm saying yeah do we have to mention that do you want to see it have to that that option is going to exist whether or not you make the condition oh, but okay. you can also make it clear by adding the condition however you want to do it but what were you asking about making them pay for the crosswalk or just the study? Because right, those are two separate things. Can we make them pay for the crosswalk if it the if if a study warrants it? We could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we need then. Okay. I kind of like that idea. Make that an attachment. Okay, Miss Miss Thompson, your lights on. My question is going to be, I know up when we, up at Sneffels, when we made a condition that they had to help pay for the light signal, mm -hmm. by the time it got to that point in the process, years down the road, it was at least triple what we had anticipated it was going to cost, and the city had to pay the difference because they had agreed to a certain amount. Is Are we not doing that this time? We wouldn't be agreeing to a specified dollar amount, just reserving the right that if the traffic warrants come back and a crosswalk is necessary at that um, location, that the developer would be responsible for installation. Okay, and Richard's would be question a dollar was, amount. would the developer have to pay for the study? Is that what the way I understand it? For the crosswalk study? I think both, actually. And the crosswalk? Mm -hmm. What if the study shows like it has to have a light and not just lines on the road or... The study likely would not come back for a signaled intersection because of the I, spacing I, I like between. the ones right over here where the students push the button and mm -hmm. the traffic has to stop. Not a traffic signal. Yeah, uh, that, that can be added into it. Okay, I just want to make sure we're not getting into a situation where they think they're agreeing to $100 and it ends up being $500 type thing, you know. from in those agreements is because of the example that you gave instead of putting with the amount that they would owe we're just putting in that they would have to fund for the construction of a complete signal to include um, any signalization that was required that way we get out of the argument of we agreed that it would be five hundred dollars but then ended up being five thousand dollars it's just you have to pay for it it's whatever the study shows Correct. is needed yeah and okay. we will be internally as a city we will be completing a study on link road once we get it finalized because we're gonna have to look at speeds on that road, what's appropriate once we get that complete build out of the hill lowered, the roundabout, all of those things. So there will be an attempt, or there will be an opportunity when we complete that to go back with those <coughs> results to the developer. So if they participate in helping pay for that at that point in the study, they would get a better deal. They already are. Okay. They're already participating to lowering that hill. So they're participating. I mean lower the hill, I mean, if, if they were required to help pay for part of the study, it would be cheaper to do it. <laughs> that study, they already are, because that study's okay. part of that whole link road project. Okay. They're okay. paying quite a bit to the to the lowering of that hill. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Quick question. You have, yeah, I, sorry, stop. You have to come up to the, you can't talk from back there. We need to have you on record. Now, uh, they're talking about a crosswalk And there. state your name, please, for the record. Uh, I'm Greg Bowman. I live at 8815 Kane Road, okay? They're talking about a crosswalk there. Now, after their construction bond is expired, is that crosswalk still gonna be valid for them to put in after the two year period? You're speaking of the, the warranty on the road itself? That's exactly right. Yeah, no, two separate things. The okay. warranty on the road will be one. The, the uh, building of the crosswalk will be totally separate. Okay, so that, that will be liable after Correct. the two year period. You bet. For how long? Yeah. We will basically what we'll do is we'll attach it to the phasing, which we don't know yet in this okay. process of when they would do it. So probably we'll put it in the mid phase. I think there are 240, 270 homes. Uh -huh. So we'll probably put it in mid. Okay. Uh, and what we want to wait is till we get that link road project. Yeah, done. I know there's going to be a, a, a boundary of when you're not mm -hmm. liable for it and when you are. But I know up to two years you're going to walk away and, and everybody's going to be stuck with the bill after that, but you're saying that's not gonna happen. Two separate things. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna have a timeline on that about how long it's gonna be? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Any other questions on this? Okay. Yeah, come forward. My name is Mike Tebow, and um, I've, I uh, am on the uh, Fountain Mutual Irrigation Ditch Board, and I would just like to read a, a few statements that would be included in the minutes. Um, I was asked to come here by Fountain Mutual uh, as a board member. Uh, we're, at, for those of you who don't know, we're an irrigation company. I've uh, been around 130 years or so. Uh, we, our water, um, we irrigate, we have a canal above this property and when the farmers uh, irrigate, that water will flow across this property. And I came just to make sure that the developers, you guys, and everybody is aware of the, that they really do a good job studying the magnitude of that water um, and that they take care of it so that that doesn't become an issue down the road. Uh, we've had it in the past um, where people ignored it, it became a problem and it was their problem. It's not the ditch company's problem. Okay, and so uh, we've had one project here of a couple years ago, Norwood Development. They, uh, they listened, they did a two-year study with piezometers, measured the water, realized that what their engineering plan was going to be wasn't going to work and they ended up having to go to a different method. So I want to read these just so that they're in the minutes and then uh, if anybody had any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. The irrigation water on that tailwater has what they call a prescriptive easement, okay? So that water from above is going to go across that property. That water cannot be detained permanently. It cannot be forced underground. It has to end up back in Fountain Creek. That's per the state law of our irrigation water. So it can be diverted. It can be channeled. It can be piped but it has to make it back to Fountain Creek. In this case, it goes into Jimmy Camp, and then it ends up down in Fountain Creek. The uh, Cumberland Green uh, people ignored us when they built that, and the water that comes through the old McGann property, if you're familiar with the area at all, it ends up on the street down there, and it runs down the street, down the curbs, and off, and that runs all summer long. Uh, this property has the same issue, or will have the same issue, um, when when uh, Jim Morley uh, was going to develop that, he went in on the north side of Kane, and he dug all that up, uh, got pl stuck plenty of equipment trying to do it, and he put a whole bunch of rock and and uh, pipe to try to take that surface water and push it down into the ground. It didn't work, and it and it does affect the road. So I mean, I think engineering can be done but they need to really take a hard look at that because there's not a real good quantity, quantification of the amount of water that ends up coming through that property. And currently, the detention pond that's there was gonna be built for that development, and now what happens, it just fills up with our irrigation water, it's completely full, then it goes out and it goes under Cane Road through the McGann property and then through Cumberland Green and down into um, the uh, Jimmy Camp. So. I just want to read these to get them on the minutes, and then I have one other comment I would like to make. Uh, so Fountain Mutual's historical ditch operations is over 100 years uh, and have included running tailwater across the Aspen, proposed Aspen Ridge property or the old Lorraine property, which is east of uh, Link Road. The historical operation have resulted in prior and, and superseded easement rights we're running FMIC tailwater across that property. The Aspen Ridge property is burdened by this historical tailwater easement and, and cannot take action that interferes with MIC's easements or rights. The owner must take adequate drainage, must, must make adequate drainage improvements that allow the continued tailwater drainage. The historical tailwater easements should not be included as a note on a recorded plat and the property, excuse me, they should be included as a note on the recorded plat of the property to, uh, property to place third parties, i.e. purchasers, home purchasers, on notice of the easements and the rights. 
FMIC will not be responsible for any flood or seepage problems for lots due to continued historical tailwater operations. So you can put that in there. And if anybody had any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I don't think so. Uh, one more note then, I'm Michael Robert Tebow. I live at 1056 Ocean Way Road. I'm a fountain resident. Um, I would uh, like to see the, the uh, when they do this PUD and they approve the PUD, that uh, the developer considers the amount of lots that he's putting there and that they try to put the bigger lots towards the east as was promised when we got annexed out there by the city of Fountain. And I don't know who all y'all were here when that happened, but I don't recognize too many people that were on the board. But we were forced annexed, most of us. Some of them wanted water, so the city ran water up there. And in that case, we got annexed. And some wanted to and some didn't. And they said when they came across that road to Link, people live out there for a lifestyle. They're all small ranches. There's some pretty expensive homes out there. Uh, the McNeese's place right to the east of this development is uh, he has this 37 acre parcel and he bought a 40 acre parcel uh, in 2000 and um, I want to say it was about 2003 uh, in order so that they didn't develop that and he paid a lot of money for it and so in their consideration th they were supposed to do two and a half acre lots and graduate to smaller lots and I've seen this plan it's got a boatload of houses on it and it's a lifestyle living out there. And if you know the people that live out there, you can go look and see that these people aren't moving. They're living there for a lifestyle and the money's not gonna change them for the next developer. They're gonna stay there until they croak. I'll be one of them. So I'd like the council just to at least consider that in the planning department to try to mitigate some of that, uh, that high density being that, on that side of the road. That's all I got. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I brought that up at the last meeting if you were here okay. for the first reading. Well, uh, I missed it. I had I was gone at another meeting and I, you know, I kind of got wind of this thing kind of late, so I yeah. apologize uh, and for so, that. No, but. that was that was uh, exactly what came up because um, uh, I asked about that as well because uh, I know where my property is and, and some of this development that was possible or that's still possibly coming in that, that's been, that transitioning has been a, uh, a big thing um, that's come up as well, so. Uh, it, it's it's in the discussion. I can tell you that uh, ultimately that um, I don't know. I'm not aware of any promises that were made that are um, that that they were promised the, these transitions. Um, you know, they were they were verbal they were verbal commitments. They were say, hey, we'll do that. And you know, they kind of did that between REA Road and Kane Road. That has some large lots in there. And I think the la though I know the last developer that tried to come in and do that. Uh, they, they couldn't get it passed through the council because the council said we're going to keep the zone like it is uh, and they did not change that. Uh, I will tell you Integrity Bank owns that property and I bank there and I do, I'm do. i a construction guy too and they came to me and said hey Mike would you go to that council and please ask them to approve this thing and change, get them to try to convince them to change that zone and I said I'm not going to do it. I said City of Fountain has done a pretty good job protecting their citizens on development even though we need it. Um, but everybody that I know for the most part lives down here is because it's a quieter community, smaller community, lifestyle, little ranchy, little farmy, people like that. And I'd like to see, I, I, I understand growth, we gotta have it, it's a good thing. Uh, and it's not because it's in my, not in my backyard type of thing, but I think they, they should consider it because if they were to act, I said, you look at my mom and dad's house, th that's a 10 acre piece with a you know half a million dollar house on it, it's not going anywhere. Uh, Greg lives next door to them. He's not going anywhere. Uh, I, I believe that Mrs. Um, Mrs. Um, um, uh, good Lord, my neighbor. Anyway, he, her daughter's taking her house when she, when she moves on. In fact, she's living there now, my place, uh, and so the Carricks and so on and so forth. And the neighbors across from me built a really nice house on 10, on, they have a, a, a uh, 17 acres I believe so it's kind of it's kind of set in stone there with those people I don't see a lot of people that are just gonna say oh the money is gonna get me out of here because they tried that in the early 2000s and nobody sold to the developers that came so I just like them to at least consider that uh, I feel like you know fountains a great place and I don't feel like we need to get the cheapest house and the most affordable li affordable living house to get those to get the the people with a lower income here, I think that we have the ability to step up the game a little bit 
and we should be able to get some people with maybe a little higher income that can afford a little nicer house and a nicer bigger lot and I think it would really bode well for the for the community the way it's built so okay that's all I got okay thank you hey, thank you for the time I appreciate it uh-huh okay I know yep I'm Fran Carrick and I live out east. Um, my position is pretty much, our position is pretty much the same as Mike's. It is a matter of lifestyle and um, I, I too would like to see those smaller lots more on this side rather than out to the east. Larger lots, right? The smaller lots. I, I, 4, I, I know where you're going. I'm, I'm 4,000 square feet is not much I mean, I think it's, they can have a 10-foot backyard and a 10-foot front yard and knock on their window and ask the neighbor for coffee. It's pretty darn close. And it is a lifestyle out there um, for people who, who like to live with horses and dogs and cats and chickens and ducks. We have it in the little ranches, and people moved out there for that rural lifestyle, and then they complained about the chickens. I remember that. <laughs> so um, I fear that is what's going to happen out there. The developers and the builders market Fountain as a rural lifestyle, and a house on 4,000 square feet is not rural. Um, so I'm just it's asking. It's next door to it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just asking that there be some consideration. And then I, too, am concerned about the water. And if any of you have any uh, questions about what it looks like when the irrigation runs and what it can do th to the roads, at the end of um, Ermel and Shumway, that road is torn to pieces every year from irrigation water. So um, I... I would hope that the developer would take this into consideration. I met with Scott and Todd today, and um, when I went to the Fountain Mutual Irrigation meeting, um, the developer had not approached them about this. So we have assurances that that's going to be a meeting that's going to take place. So um, thank you very much. I okay. appreciate your time. Thank you. Density of the properties in there and being state at 4,000 the square feet. Pardon? State your Gr name again for Greg the Greg Bowman. Okay. Uh, the density of the properties is at 4,000 square feet. With all the tailwater that comes in that area, it's going to congest it a little bit more. Even just putting a 48 inch pipe down the side of that sidewalk or down that street is not going to get rid of all that water. We know that. We're, we're not kidding ourselves. 4,000 square foot lots are gonna condense that water a little bit more, make a lot more problems for the foundations, for the walls, for everything that they have out there, the streets as well. True or false? So bottom line is what, what we're looking for is a little larger lot size, something that's more livable. It's like you said last, time, last meeting, you grew up on a 6,000 square foot lot and you had some, some concerns about that 4,000 square foot lot. We have a lot of concerns because we drive through there every day. It's our neighborhood. That's where we live. That's, our, that's where our kids play. We don't want to drive through broken roads and broken sidewalks and looking at tore up stuff uh, based on the density of this water and everything that goes through there. So if we can do something about the lot size, it make a big difference in how everybody feels about this whole deal, especially me. I mean, uh, it's just... just I, I travel these roads every day, so I'd hope in your considerations you would think about what the density of these lots are going to do with the amount of water we have and stuff, and this is what we talked about last time, because to the south of that road is full of water year-round. From what I, I know what I send out of my property, and I'm the guy that's actually sending that water through that property. I know how much water goes through there. Uh, one pipe is not going to fix the problem so you got to find something that's going to be you know uh, uh, justifiable for everybody i mean yeah like i said you can put catch basins all the way down the side of a road and try and defer it and everything else but you gotta you you gotta look at the more 
concrete, the more footings, the more stuff you put in there is going to trap all that, and it's going to create a problem for people in the future. Okay? The 4,000 square foot lots are going to bring in a little less desirable than what, what we want in that neighborhood. Um, unfortunately, that's just going to be a fact. The, the larger lot sizes would, would really help the situation. Okay? Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. Um, is, is externally you're coming up. Um, you can come up while I'm asking a question. Uh, when does that piece of it come in where we really start talking about transitioning? Um, um, after Mr. Rick speaks, I can come and address uh, various questions that the, the members of the public okay. uh, mentioned. Thanks. Gordon Rick, I just want to bring to Council's attention uh, I had a conversation with Dr. Romero, uh, the Deputy Superintendent for District 8. The, in this development, the children will be going, be bused to Jordahl Elementary. However, what she said was once Countryside South starts to develop, she's going to have to redraw the boundaries and children in this development will then be forced to go to Eagleside. So they're going to have to walk across that link road sometime in the near future she couldn't give me a timeline because it just depends on when countryside south starts building and we don't know when that's going to be so i strongly recommend we put in the caveat about putting in a crosswalk later thank you okay thanks anybody else okay and as she's walking up I, again we're just at the planning stages there's the, all that engineering around the water, that, that, that's kind of going to be their, their biggest um, uh, task. And if they can't get it figured out, then they're, they just can't simply do it. Um, so it's, it, just because we're signing off on the, the preliminary plan doesn't mean it's, it's a go-ahead. I'm still, as I said before, I am concerned about the transitioning between the larger, I, I don't even call them lots because they're so big, um, but the larger areas and straight to 4,000. I still think it's crazy because when I moved into Countryside West, we were at 6,000 lots, and, they, and, and we have a, well, not we, my wife had a problem with being able to go to our neighbor's window and ask for coffee. Um, she'd rather just make it in her, in her space. So I get it, and, and so it's, it's an issue. I still, at 4,000, I, I, I know trends and the way things go um, with everything that just because it, that's where everybody's going is 4,000 square lots doesn't mean it's, in this area, it's the right thing to do, especially transitioning. So, um, I mean, if, yeah. We want to make sure that everyone understands that we're going to make sure, Mike being in development, he understands the rigors of our processes. Oh, yeah. And we, we get had, yelled at about all the time. Yeah, he's let me know that how rigorous they are. But one of them was specifically about the water problems that he would have and that we've put on some pretty heavy demands on him. We're going to make sure that the, the same is done with this uh, project and as a matter of fact uh, we went back and we found some documentation um, the, the the applicants and their engineers have been involved I've got two from 2018 and one in 2019 working with Fountain Mutual um, on the different issues that are going to go on and we'll add another layer and make sure that they go to one of their board meetings so that the, everything they hear and that we get them working directly together I don't want to make sure our engineers aren't in the middle of that I want to make sure that those engineers are working with Fountain Mutual because there's a lot of validity that when that irrigation occurs out there that the water levels change. If you do a study and you do it right now, it's completely different once irrigation season starts. And there's no way I want that on my plate um, that, well, we studied it in January, but now we didn't do it when the irrigation flows. So I'll take us out of the middle. We'll be involved with quality control, but I'm going to make sure that they get together on that and they take care of that. At the right times. In a rigorous process at the right times. Okay. Ms. Martinez. Okay. Well, I'll mark that one off my list. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> um, regarding the lot transitions that's already uh, built into their overall development plan um, and is consistent with the annexation agreement as well, it does have the larger lots on the east side of the development. Um, ranging from eight to 10,000 square feet and then transitions to the smaller lots as it's internal to the development and a long link. Um, so buffering that to the east. Um, if you could pull up the aerial real quick. Okay, so 
so directly here's right here is link in squirrel creek the development in question is located right here directly north of it is already planned for commercial and zoned commercial directly east is one of the property owners that mr tivo had mentioned um, it is currently zoned r1 which already allows a minimum of uh, 6,000 square feet and then it's larger lots as you transition east directly south of the development are all individually privately owned um, lots or parcels um, so that if in the future they ever want to subdivide they do have that option but the city's not forcing them at this time so in terms of transition both uh, the Aspen Ranch development has an annexation agreement that has the lot transitions built in in addition to the McNeese property directly east so the lot transitions already been um, discussed and negotiated and built into this overall development plan so 10 to 8,000 8 to 10,000 are along or 8 to 10 yeah 8 to 10,000 is along um, this roadway right here and that other property you, you refer to what what are their plans with that right now uh, they do live on the 37 and 40 acre uh, parcel um, they don't have any current plans but as a safeguard in uh, the early 2000s they did annex into the city and negotiate an annexation agreement which did stipulate the lot transitions and lot sizes for that oh, it development. Did okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But there are no current applications at this time for, okay. for that. Okay, I have a couple lights on. I'll start with Mr. Keek. My concern is, uh, has the developer met with the people out there in that area that seem to be pretty upset about this? And if they haven't, why haven't they? Just questioning that seems like to me rather than come in here and argue about that stuff they could meet with those people and see if they couldn't get something settled prior to coming to a council meeting I just think that might be the easier way to do it that's okay all I you don't have they okay. shook their head no okay they had okay, met with them, so. okay so that's a great suggestion uh, Ms. Thompson I agree with mr. geek that was actually gonna be one of my comments so thank you for beating me to it because um, it's a great question um, then my other one is, was this included in like the city's, I don't even know what to call it anymore, the city's master plan overall development, whatever we did a few years ago, as far as the lot sizes? For the um, city? The, mass, the comprehensive plan? Yeah. Um, the comprehensive plan was done in 2005. I don't recall off the top of my head if it was um, planned for this develop or this density at that time. I'd, I'd like to, to know if it was planned for that because I know we got, we had another developer very upset with us for maybe four or five years ago that mm. the city comprehensive plan said two and a half acre lots and he was trying to come in and do much smaller lots and we didn't allow that and um, he was rather upset. But so were the citizens too for telling us for driving business out of town so you just <coughs> can't win sometime. So. Okay, uh, and Mr. Applegate? Yeah, uh, land is expensive and the smaller lots might be a little bit cheaper. Ms. Meininger spoke about maybe some lower cost houses and that's a distinct possibility too. We don't know what they're building or what they're gonna price at, but it may be a little better than larger lots and one thing we will not decide on is whether they're undesirables or not. That's not even gonna come into our consideration. Were there people that are going to buy homes and move here? That's what we're look, talking about now. Okay, thank you. All right. I don't okay. have anything else. No other changes. Um, so the only thing, and, and this is difficult, and, and every time a new development comes in, especially in this area, any of these areas where it's, it's really wide open, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it kind of it brings our own mort mortality a little bit. I guess is the best way to equate this into the into the discussion because um, I think forever people just thought, well, if I'm out here, there's nothing. No one's ever going to come out here, and then all of a sudden, uh, I look at Mark Shuffle Road. I look at Lorson, uh, the one poor family that had their nice big thing right there on uh, um, Fontaine and Mark Shuffle, and and now there's just a million houses right behind them, and that's that's county controlled, and so. Um, county's like sure just put whatever you want in there it's okay um, so um, at least with the city we're trying to, to trying to do the best thing and in, in trying to create some of these transitions and things you know we have other properties on that list that already have master plan communities in place that they're that they're really looking at 
um, moving forward with. And these are, you know, 20 to 30 year developments that um, that uh, are going to affect everything that we have here. And I, I get the whole, um, you know, this is our lifestyle and this is what we, what we bought it for. Um, at the same time, other people buy those properties around us and and they have different ideas and of what they want to do. And, and as growth continues, that's just, that's a reality I think we have to face. And, and uh, it's, it's not the fun part of, of, of development and growth, but um, it is what it is. And, and it, it's, for lack of a better word, it sucks sometimes, but uh, um, I don't know. Uh, it's been one of the biggest struggles, I think, for this community um, over the last 20 years of, of just the uh, amount of growth and, and what's kind of going away um, uh, because Color Springs keeps um, trying to get on these top 10 lists of how wonderful we are. So uh, I'll talk to the mayor about that tomorrow. But um, uh, I know his community is pretty upset about that too. So anyway. Um, Regarding Mr. Applegate's comment, um, is it a possibility that this would be low-income housing out there? I, I, that, I have to ask the developer on that one. I don't. So we don't know that, that yet. Yeah. So it's he's going to charge as much as. Um, yeah, he's going to charge as much as he's in allowed big money. to because it's all about the money. Right. So we know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with no further discussion, we'll go ahead and make a m decision. On, oh. Yeah, if you. If, I don't know if you need to. If you want to, you, you can. want to. Okay, well, I, I've been asking for, and you just sat there, so you well, need to uh, take some initiative and get up. You, well, you want to make the money here, so well, go ahead. public comment was first, so I just want to make sure we have a chance to... Go ahead. I don't want to use the term re rebuttal, but... Uh, <laughs> well, and we were asking a question earlier, and no one said anything, so go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. I must have missed that if, uh, regarding the, the applicant. Uh, uh, my name is Jason Allwine. I'm with Matrix Design Group. We were the applicant representing... Uh, uh, developer and the property owner in this case. Um, uh, we did talk in length, if you remember, December about the, the lot sizes, the transitions, the buffers, and I can quickly run through that again w with more detailed slide. Uh, we feel we are, we are meeting those transitions and we are meeting the annexation agreement uh, that was put in place in 2005. Uh, so uh, does this have the pointer? So per the annexation uh, agreement land use map, as you can see along the eastern boundary, we are bound by certain restrictions. Uh, the, we'll call it pink or red is a six to 8,000 square foot in size. Uh, that occurs here and here, as well as the green is eight to 10, eight to 10,000 square foot in size as per, the, per that annexation agreement. Uh, let me jump ahead. Uh, this map indicates uh, with ODP that we, um, along the eastern boundary, uh, and per the design standards, which is a sort of a detailed uh, design standard table on the cover sheet, indicates that the minimum lot sizes will will meet the six to eight thousand here in here, as well as the eight to ten thousand square foot here, to um, be in compliance with that annexation agreement. Regarding the four thousand square foot lots, um, that's the the orange color here, and here. That represents about a third of our total lot mix or projected lot mix. And as you can see, we strategically place those interior to the development. Uh, they're surrounded by, you know, 5,000 up to 6,000 square foot lots, the larger lots here. And then again, up here, strate strategically placed along Link Road because it's a busy intersection. Uh, and that's where higher density tends to want to gravitate towards just to buffer the, the five and 6,000 square foot lots with, with a smaller unit mix. So we, we put those they're strategically not throughout the community, but sort of internal and against Link Road, uh, we felt that's an appropriate place for those 4,000 square foot lots. Uh, I don't see your 8 to 10,000 square foot lots. Well, so, so they're identified right here just in a basic brown. Um, they Show that, show six to eight on the plan here. Correct, for a minimum. So the minimum size we have to meet per the annexation agreement is 6,000 here and 6,000 there and 8,000 here, that is codified or will be codified on the approved development plan working with staff to ensure those notes are in place to be in compliance with the annexation agreement. 
So we need to be at a minimum 8,000 square foot lots right here and a minimum 6,000 square foot lots, this bank here and this bank right there. And the ODP restricts the lot sizes with notes and call outs to meet the annexation agreement requirements. But will there be tans? It doesn't say anything about tans there. Uh, tan, you meaning? So, so this. 10,000. There's six to eight. There's six and there's eight. There's no tan on the plan here. Right. Correct. Th let me back up. So the annexation agreement is so this green lot, which is identified in the brown, is eight to ten thousand square foot, a minimum of eight thousand square feet. We have identified on the overall development plan that that these units right here, this this block, this area, has to be a minimum of eight thousand square feet. Similar to this block of we'll call it magenta red here and here. It's a minimum of 6,000 square feet. We can't be any smaller than 6,000. Right, the so I, the, uh, the question is, where are the 10,000 square foot, or you're not just putting them? So uh, the answer is, that comes in, in the preliminary plan stage. Right now, this is essentially a bubble diagram indicating we have an area identified as a minimum, a minimum of 6, 8,000 square foot here and 6,000 square foot there. What that right. final lot size is is part of the next step okay. with the preliminary plan that oh. has to go through the town staff. They will ensure compliance with our with our lot sizes. Okay, so I, I think I'm I'm hoping I you're getting the message that you know when I was in school and I was told to write a, a four to six page paper. What did I write? I wrote a four four page paper. Um, so I. It, even though my teacher would have rather me like to write to six. So I, I think you get the message. Um, Understood. And so yes. when it comes back and all we see is the minimums, you're going to have a very hard time. Understood. So that's all I got and, and to be frank, Christy and I have had conversations regarding the lot sizes. And because this is an ODP, it's essentially, I don't call it a bubble diagram, but it's an area diagram. Um, that level of detail and review happens at the preliminary plan stage. And, and we understand that. I. I yep. Right. Just trying to, so, so trying I to can't prove a point now so we don't have to do it later. Uh, understood. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, re Can you go back to that <coughs> slide you were at before you, with the other fancy color? There. Yes. Okay. Somebody asked a question. If you look, there's two red blocks in this that are the 10,000. So, okay. So this 10 to 12 is right here. So that is east of, this is Crescent Moon. This is our eastern boundary. This this minimum of ten to twelve thousand square foot is right here. That is this block right here. But that that is not your property. Correct. It is not. Okay. Our our property is bounded by this right. white border. Okay. Right. But I'm right just here. saying that there's it's still kind of a boundary. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Y you know, and, and would also point out is you know, block magenta here is currently identified as six thousand. You can go as low as six thousand square foot lots, if at some point in the future you know, pre previous comments aside, whether that's 40 years, 50 years, 200 years, could go as low as 6,000 square foot lots east of our property. Well, they could, but. C could, I mean, not saying they're, they're going to, I'm so just I saying. From I've a been on this council for 16 years, and in 16 years, every council and every citizen has never pushed for the minimum in that transition, uh, so. Understood. Um, and we would get into semantics, but uh, I don't know if you want to do that with me. Um, Okay, anything else? Uh, yes, I would like to speak uh, briefly on the, the, the drainage. Um, going back again, this was talked to quite a bit at the December hearing. Um, we, we certainly heard the concerns. Uh, as Mr. Evans mentioned, we have met and been in contact with, um, with FMIC. We do have a letter dated October 25th, 2019, I believe, uh, sort of indicating that we can't guarantee estimate of flows. So one to three releases per year we understand we need to accomplish or uh, accommodate for those flows. Uh, what I'd like to point out with this map is this is our MDDP. It is a master drainage development plan. This is the, call it the 30,000 foot view of the drainage in this area. As we go through preliminary plan and final plan, we have to drill in much more detail of how this drainage comes to the site, how we capture that drainage, how we treat that drainage, how we bypass the tailwater around and through our site without detaining it and without stopping it, 
Uh, we know staff will be um, tuned into those details. Uh, we'll work closely, closely with them to make sure we address the concerns of not only the neighbors as well as the staff that we're accomplishing. I'd just like to point out that th this basin that we study as a part of our MDP is 200 and approximately 50 acres. It's a very large basin, so we know there's a lot of water coming through essentially one location. Uh, drilling down in a bit more detail with the FMIC water, it collects approximately right here. Uh, and working with FMIC, we uh, are proposing to pipe that. Right now, that is a 48 inch proposed pipe. That's a fairly significant size pipe to capture that tailwater. It captures, gets piped around and directly across Link Road out to the west. It does not enter our detention facility, uh, does not get detained. It's essentially called a bypass flow uh, because we cannot stop that water. Right. You said you, you, you sent them, or they have sent you a letter October 25th? Uh, correct. A October 25th, 2019, correct. That's not what. Uh, I mean, that, I mean we, we have it. April 25th, 2019, signed um, Gary Elstein, uh, Fountain Mutual Irrigation Company. So you Sharon. were contacted. Sharon. The, the ditch um, company was contacted. Apparently. Okay. We, 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 yeah, and, and we have additional. Yeah, okay. All right, I just needed this. I know. Yeah, we have to. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, just again, the reader, we. we we know that drainage is, is a very large concern, uh, and obviously as we drill down in the, in the details, we, we can either, as mentioned earlier, we can either accommodate it um, or we cannot, and we'll have to come up with a solution to do so. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Any further questions for him? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Just one more thing. I did attend the stockholders, um, stakeholders <coughs> irrigation meeting um, in January. Um, they have one meeting a year with Fountain Mutual Irrigation. And I asked them at that meeting if they had been contacted by the developer regarding the development they were putting on Kane and Link. And Gary Steen was there, Mike Fink was there, Mike Tebow was there. All of the other board members were there, and they all said unequivocally, no. So um, there's obviously a memory recall deficiency. There's a letter there. If there is a letter here. But we were told, yeah, but, but we were told in that meeting that they had not been contacted. Okay. So I'm just good. want you to know. Good. And okay. To make sure that they yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Greg Bowman. So as a master plan, uh, they have 4,000 square foot lots going in. What percentage would be in the 10,000 range, the 8,000 range, the 5,000, the 6,000? Uh, are we going to be 1% on the 10,000 square foot lots and 3% on the 8,000? They have a master plan that's already drawn up, right? We should be able to find out the high percentage of the 4,000 to, to 5,000 square foot lots, which is going to raise the density of that property. True or false? Can we, can we as residents get some kind of information on that? Again, that I've never been contacted and I live the next farm right up from this project. Yeah. I've never been contacted since this whole project's been going on. So I don't know exactly what they have going on, but I would like to know, I would like to have some kind of an idea of what's going on down there. And that's, that's why the suggestion was made to meet with the, because um, you, you are not a part of the path of the least resistance. So. Um, yeah, so we're going to see if we can push that issue a little bit. And I appreciate sure that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we can get back to the map, and I can kind of answer what those percentages are. Uh, re regarding the neighborhood meeting, um, when we submitted this, we followed code as far as sending the letters out, notifications. Um, don't recall any major issues coming up. Clearly with staff, if there was a need for a neighborhood meeting based on um, adjacent letters of either opposition or questions. Uh, I know staff very well. We would have had that neighborhood meeting. Um, with the Post and the Planning Commission, obviously there were some public comments, but up until that date, we hadn't sort of seen or heard any major opposition 
uh, with with the project. Uh, I know it, but that happens. And it, it does. Understand. Uh, so to answer the question based on the the areas in the projected sort of calculations uh, we have 10 percent roughly of the six we'll call it six to ten thousand square foot lots based on the annexation agreement uh, most of our units are a minimum of five thousand and larger that's over half of 55 percent and again that roughly 36 percent is the four thousand square foot lots and again th those lots we, we're meeting the annexation agreement requirements uh, and agreements in place with those larger lots on the border. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, uh, let's uh, go ahead and see if we can make a decision on a second reading. We have the provision about the, um, uh, if we'd like to add on about the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is going to, there's more pieces and parts to this that's uh, got to go through planning and, and planning commission and and one of our planning commission members is back there. He's heard quite a bit and understands what um, c concerns and frustrations are and, and where we go from there. So, uh. Just a clarification for whoever makes the motion. Do we have to, I understand about the crosswalk, we yeah. want to add that, but do we have to read in the four recommendations that are in here or is that, Christy said that had been included? Those were already in included in the first reading, so unless you want to amend or change those, they do not need to be read okay. back into the record. All right. It's just been a few minutes since you said it. Are we ready to make a motion? We're ready. Okay. Mr. Applegate. Yeah, I move that we uh, accept ordinance 1743 on second reading with the exemption that whatever the traffic study shows is needed there will be put in by the developer. Mr. Lauer. I have a second. Okay, Discussion. A, I'm sorry. Discussion, please. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I understand your motion, but I believe the discussion was around a, a crosswalk. And by making the motion, it says whatever is needed there. If the city comes back and says it needs a traffic signal and a left turn lane and all sorts of stuff, would that motion make that person responsible for all that when I believe what possibly was meant would be just the crosswalk? I don't know. I'm, I'm no, because it might need a light, like you said. Answering what to the affirmative? Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood what his motion was at that point. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, uh, go ahead and vote. I have five yes, two no, Council Member Thompson and Mayor Ortega voting no. Motion carried. Okay. Um, I would like to clarify why I voted no on that because I'm not voting no against the development. I'm voting no against the motion that was made that he would have to pay for any and all development that the study showed. I would have agreed to a crosswalk, <coughs> paying for the crosswalk, but um, if it came back and said they needed to dump another million dollars into it for things that on, they're only partially responsible for and other developers could also be responsible for part of it. I didn't think that was necessarily fair to the developer to be responsible for all of it. Okay, uh, mine is simply, um, ag again, about the transitioning and, uh, you know, and, and I mentioned the path of lethal resistance. I mentioned, um, you know, you're going to go with the minimum anytime you can. We're, we're all in it for the big buck. You know, we're constantly... Um, as a city berated by developer A and B and C because we're so difficult to work with. Um, yet all the concerns that people are coming up with are the exact reason why we're so difficult. Uh, we're not up here doing this because it's, it's just a fun thing to do. To, um, uh, but at the same time, there, there are people who, who are a part of this community for a long time and, 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 and growth is hard on people. And, and just to come in and, and uh, do what you think you're gonna do in your little plot of the land and, and get out of here 
uh, that's happened too much and too often here. And and uh, and if we're going to be difficult, and we're going to be difficult. Um, if you don't want to build here because of that, then find somewhere else, I guess. I don't know. Uh, we're going to continue to be difficult. We're not the only entity that you have to deal with. Um, but uh, it, we've been burned a few times, and we don't want to keep getting burnt. And so um, we're going to keep asking the questions. And, and uh, I don't know that we need to ask every developer to come in and, and meet with the neighbors. Um, I think it's good business. I think it's um, the best way to get what you want in. Um, we shouldn't have to be told that, 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 it's, that it's, it's a good thing to do. I don't know. Um, maybe that's just me being naive. So um, we'll go ahead and put, continue moving forward. Item 8B. Um, Second reading ordinance of number 1744, an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city of Fountain from single family small lot residential district and village center district to plan unit development district for properly generally located east of Link Road and north of Kane Road, also known as Aspen Ranch, here and after more specifically described in exhibits A and <coughs> B. The first reading of the rezone request did accompany the overall development plan for Aspen Ranch, which was heard and approved at December 10th, 2019. Um, there have been no changes to this ordinance since first reading. Okay. Any questions on this? Any questions from the public? Okay, seeing none, what would council like to do with this item? Uh, Ms. Thompson. Move to approve. And Ms. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. A second. Okay, we have a motion and second for approval on second reading. Please vote. Six yes, one no. Motion carried. Mayor Ortega voting no. Okay, and item 8C, second reading of ordinance number 1742. An ordinance repealing and reordaining Title 17 zoning of the Fountain Municipal Code and all, the, all other ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict therewith and declaring a zoning map with a print date of November 13th, 2019 as the official zoning map. Uh, Ms. Martinez. Thank you. This is the second reading of Ordinance 1742, which is to codify Title 17 of the Fountain Municipal Code, which focuses on the zoning ordinance specifically. At first reading on November 19th, it was approved subject to 10 conditions, and I will not read all 10 conditions. Um, but one condition I do want to focus on is uh, condition number eight, which uh, dealt with the signs within the right-of-way. One of the um, parts of the condition included uh, an allowance of unlimited signage between October 1st and the first Wednesday after November 1st. After that, went through a legal review to ensure that it was um, content neutral based on the uh, the Supreme Court case of Reed versus Gilbert, the attorneys came back and said that it was not um, content neutral and therefore would have to be modified. So in order to uh, still follow through with the intent of city council, staff would recommend um, that that section be amended to remove that exception of the additional signage between October 1st and the first Wednesday after November 1st, but add a um, extended period revocable permit allowance for any applicant that would provide for a 30 day consecutive time period one time of year for them to put up the sign. So it would apply universally to anybody to place signs within the right of way one time a year and not limit it to a specified time period. Otherwise there were no other changes to that ordinance okay uh, mr. Applegate yeah on the 30 days that you're giving everybody that's still content neutral isn't it how could we tell them you can't put that sign up because of what it says we're not saying anything about what it says but it's content um, biased when it's specified to a certain time period of the year because it's implied that we're allowing greater signs for uh, for elections if we are allowing that to anybody any time during the year, then we are not violating the Supreme Court decision. Is the Supreme Court say you can't do it around election time because it might give an advantage to election signs? It's providing an allowance specifically to anybody putting up those election signs and would not provide that same allowance to anybody else during the same time of Why the year. Why wouldn't it? Because if somebody in March wants to put up a, a sign for no, what advertising I'm saying is something. in October, mm -hmm. anybody can still put up anything they want to put up. Correct, but it's content neutral based on that time period. So when you tie a time period to it, it's making it violate the federal Supreme Court so that we allowed it to be any time during the year that somebody- I don't understand that. Period. It's content neutral here, it's content neutral there. All we're saying is that you can't do it except that time of year. 
if we do it this time of year, you're going to have people different days of different weeks and months all getting their 30 day permits. It'd be a nightmare for anybody to ever monitor who's been up for how long or anything else. Troy. This is a particular uh, question that that um, one lower court has uh, has has taken up and it, and what they had decided and, and I would it's not a reported case yet um, it's it's not written in stone law but the idea would be that this kind of regulation while content neutral on its face in application uh, is actually not content neutral because it's clearly designed to circumvent the the spirit of what the Supreme Court decided which was uh, which was that all signs should be content neutral. And that was, that was sort of the spirit of what the Supreme Court decided. And so in application, this and, and a regulation of, of having signs up just during election season, while potentially content neutral on its face, in application it really exists to allow people to put up election signs, which is against the spirit of the law. That's pretty um, vague. <laughs> so, so it it in I kind of, I guess kind of the summary would be is is um, we may have found a loophole that may end up getting closed, um, and and so we, I'm not sure we want to be on the on the wave that that has the loophole question in court going forward. It would be the way that I would explain it. Oh, well, okay, I see that, but this is going to be impossible to enforce. 30 day things will come at any day they come in and get a permit to go further and they're going to be all different days they're going to be all over town they're going to be doing whatever they want to do no they yeah. can't pull a second one i thought it was 30 days no it's just but one there'll be different people at different times coming in all the time oh, well i mean if they want to put the time and effort in to do that i guess mm -hmm. i think no, what he's saying is i come in for my candidate and i if i'm helping a candidate i come in on monday and pull a sign permit right and then greg comes in and pulls one on Tuesday for the same candidate, and she comes in on Wednesday and pulls one for the same candidate. We're all getting 30 days, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Because we can't But is it 30 days from when they pull that? It's uh, for like not more than 30 consecutive days and cannot be issued consecutively at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, so it would be based on the applicant. It has to be because it's an extension. I okay. guess more, no, more my question is, I can't pull it on January 1st and use it, use my 30 days any time in the year. It has to be that. Correct. January it would 1st. be January 1st. Right. So, okay. Troy, can we, just to make it for ease of the office staff, so they're not spending hours every day issuing these permits, can you say permits are only issued on Mondays between 10 and 2 or 4 and 7? Or so, I mean, I'm trying to make it so that's we don't have to hire a part-time person that does nothing but issue these permits i mean and then somebody that has to enforce them what would the reality of i really don't think it's going to be a huge <laughs> issue i don't see it as a huge issue except for a couple of months every year mm -hmm. I, mean <laughs> I don't think it would be the burden would probably not be on administrative staff but it may be on code enforcement code trying to enforce right, these things right that's what i'm trying that to figure would, out is that would how make it difficult and i don't i don't know the answer to that i don't know how to so then our other choice is just to say no signs no well we have two choices then well you know no signs boom we're done mm -hmm. do my little thing up here again we say yes to signs then we can still do the thursday friday to monday noon to noon correct period still do that period mm -hmm. or no signs or no signs or a different or a different guidance correct okay correct. a different idea that anybody would come up with free for all is that your light time? I'm sorry? Your light's on, is, is that? Oh, that was from. That part of it? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, um, I'm just trying to make sure. Correct. I, I'm trying to think of the management of it from the code enforcement and the staff permit um, process mm -hmm. of it. And and can we charge for these permits, Troy? Yes, we can. Oh, heck yeah. I mean, oh yes, we will. Yes, <laughs> there will be a fee associated it's, with the permit. So there'll be a fee associated with the permit. So how do you, so can we? <laughs> I got another. Can there be two fees? Can there be one for the, the like the, I'll call them snipe signs for the weekend signs for yes. ease. Okay, there would be the, two separate so fees, the one for the signs for the weekend and one for the extended period. The extended can have, can, and oh, we can make it like $400, $500, so they really don't want to come out here and pull it. <laughs> 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 
It's got to pay for the people that are going to pick it up and monitor it. Why, why should the average citizen who is not, doesn't care about signs have to pay for code enforcement when it, you know, and I get, I get, I've been there, I've put out my share of <coughs> political signs over the years, some in the right place. Oh, all of them in the right place. Okay. okay. Mr. Applegate. Yeah, I have a question for Troy. What would be happening if we just wait another month other than October? So we had two different months that they could do it during the year. Then at least we could monitor when the signs are out, make it June or something that they can have that month. Uh, to me, that just seems like semantics. Yeah. Uh, especially if, if you know, it, it could be, you know, what if you choose primary season and a court could interpret that as uh, both being for election signs, right? Um, so and if we did it in April, it would be a different advantage to the realtors. Yeah, potentially, yeah, and they could, they could, they, but they could, but they could interpret it either way, right? That that whatever whatever season you pick, or you pick summertime, or you know, uh, early spring, and you would help the you would help the the people who post signs to irrigate your lawn, um, right? And and I think you run into that. You're going to run into that. However, you pick a time period, a time period is gonna is gonna be interpreted as you're trying to regulate the content. St. Patrick's Day. People I don't see it that way, but whatever. I mean, it, it make it fair for everybody. How you can do that? Outline, again, again I don't think all. it's I don't think it's crystal clear, but I think that's what the way the courts are going. Law them all. You're going to have people saying you're infringing on their freedom of speech. But this is only public right of ways. This is not on your private Free property. You speak all they want. They so if you own a fence on 85, you may have a new business. <laughs> 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 Rent your fence out. <laughs> basically going to have signs out all year then. Always. Okay. I hate signs. Um, anybody have anything to say on this one? Chris, one last, Christy, yeah. a lot of cities, rather than struggle with this, as, as you pulled up some of the document, a lot of cities are just going to. No signs in the no right No signs away. in the right That's of correct. way. Yeah. Rather than dealing with the struggle that we're facing tonight. Yeah, I believe, uh, I can't, Pueblo? Um, Pueblo, Longmont, Arvada, Boulder, there's various others. Colorado Springs hasn't undertaken their code yet. Right. The county hasn't undertaken their code yet. So locally, we are the first to embark on this yeah. transition. Correct. Yeah, that's they the avoid thing. all you issues just by just it. saying. And then you just have to find people's private property to put your signs on. Correct. Rent their space on their fence. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Troy. You know, I think this is an, an important issue. We can also move forward with um, this item without signs and keep discussing it. That's an option that we have as well, and 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 get this get this passed and then deal with signs later if we wanted to and we uh, just throw that out there, there. If, if there's some disagreement <laughs> or we just hash it out right now and figure it out and I've been through the sign thing before it's, it's not fun okay it's a difficult issue to tackle and address and we can always come back and amend it in a year yes if there's can. a huge problem and people are really upset about it yes. once we're through the presidential election and no signs if we go that route we can come back and rehash it okay. right. Ms. Estes. A uh, quick question, Troy. On um, if we go to no signs, does that set us up for any lawsuits because of not providing no. freedom of speech? Nope. Um, ab absolutely not. It would actually be the easiest and cleanest and uh, least risky option to do, quite frankly. So if if I had a vote, that's what I would vote. Uh, cause, <laughs> because because uh, <laughs> just just uh, <laughs> Let me finish. Let me finish. Um, just be just because it would make less work for me. That's what I'll say. <laughs> so it would make. And by the way, if, if you want would, his vote in the next election, it would certainly make my job easier if you did that. You don't want to go to Supreme Court. <laughs> I do not. That would, I, well, that would be fun, but an no. all expense paid trip to DC. <laughs> And yeah, code enforcement would agree. That's, that's really a huge concern for me is how much code and time do we want code enforcement to spend trying to figure out the signs. And then people are c upset because their neighbor has weeds up to their armpits and they don't have time to do about it because they're chasing signs down the road. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know if Chris has dealt with this, but I used to deal with a tremendous amount of sign calls in October. 
both sides, especially in political season. So it's a bet. When, and that, that part, though, is always going to come up, whether Correct. we allow them or not, mm -hmm. or have these, that's always going to be there. That's a part of it. So, okay. All right, let's, uh, without making this any further, um, any questions or comments from the public? Can we talk about just one question on compliance? If we do go this way, obviously it's going to be a huge change to our community. And Correct. with it not being allowed in communities around us, if, we, if it does vote for no, is there any type of way to... Inform the public of the change? Inform the public. And a, grace period? A grace peri not necessarily a, a grace period for no fines. Is there going to be fines if they have to pick them up if they're in the right of way? I mean, how is that? I don't believe there's fines associated with it. Um, they would just be pulled and disposed of. Um, it would really just be an information push out through social media, the local newspaper, handouts, and just getting the information out to the public. But, in any but I know form in the possible. past they've made an attempt to save signs for people, and it just becomes a nightmare of trying to get all that done. So, CDOT, if they pull your sign, it's, it's gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm kind okay. of trying to get to. Why don't if you we're stay up there? No because this will be easier for you. No signs. Um, so I've. Over the last month, I took some pictures of some signs around town, and I'd like to go through them very quickly to get Christie's opinion of under the current ordinance, would these signs be allowed or not allowed? Okay. That, well, I, yes, sir. What's the point of this? I want to make sure we understand what we're getting rid of with this ordinance. Well, I think we know. Signs in the right of way. Go ahead. Is that, is that 25 or 30 or 10? Five. Okay, quickly. Okay, I, next th that, slide. That sort of thing needs to get approved through uh, us first because um, th this is belaboring the point. We haven't even decided if we're going to allow them or not. I don't know that we need to get into this, um, who, what they look like. I, I think we I all can, have a pretty good idea. So I can uh, back off if you want me to. Uh, if me. everybody wants to hear it or see it, go ahead and go ahead. Next slide, please. Oh. Oh, I can do that. Sorry. So this is a sign that was out at Squirrel Creek and Lank Road, a community Christmas dinner, a free giveaway hosted by the Hanover Community Church. This is a, a banner. It's about six feet by two feet. Would this be allowed under our current code? The current code or, or the, the proposed? The, the proposed code. No. No. So banners such as for because it would not meet the minimum height and area right if it's in the right of way right so any kind of banner whether it be for um bible school uh summer school for kids uh juneteenth uh celebration uh historical preservation week all those kind of banners would go away next slide please uh, Fountain Community Theater. Uh, it's about four feet wide by three feet high. This would be allowed or not be allowed anymore? Um, it would depend on the size of it if it met the minimum area and height. Okay. And it, would, it doesn't appear to meet the minimum setback as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this meets the height and requirements. However, as I understand it, these signs would only be allowed uh, from Friday to Monday, most of these sports type signs they want to put up for several weeks trying to get kids to join up. Um, would they be allowed a sign for the 30 day permit for each s sport or would it be? Based on the applicant. It would be on the applicant. Okay. So wouldn't be allowed, they'd be allowed to do it once a year. Correct. It's a one time permit. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, this one is essentially the same as the previous one, other, other than it's much, much bigger. However, it's put up by the city, so correct me if I'm wrong, this sign is allowed because since the government put it up on government property, they can correct. put whatever they want. We can put it on government property, correct. Okay. Um, when this ordinance was completed in, or, uh, I believe it was November, did we post it on the city website or did uh, McCool Solutions post it on their website so people could review the final draft? It's located in both locations. There's a link on the city's planning department page that directs them to the um, 
public link that's hosted by Nick Cool. Okay, thank you. That I would just bring up to council, we're making a huge change here to what we've been doing in the past. We're gonna be getting rid of all these types of signs. Uh, be careful what we get rid of. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, so we need to approve or disprove the actual second reading um, with the caveat of do we want to allow them based on uh, the wording that staff provided to us or do we just want to disallow it altogether on, on right away? So um, that one. Does, that does that make sense? Did I make, is that clear? Yes. Okay, thank I you. will answer yes. Thank you. I'm looking at he doesn't want yes. any work. So in the title 17, all 10 conditions from first reading can either be carried over with the amendment that staff suggested or condition eight can be modified to not allow them. Okay. Yes. So do not so need to read all 10 again, only if you're going to make amendments to condition eight. But we can do the weekend signs so the realtors can have the signs out in public right away. Yeah, that can stay as if you want that. I personally they're going to put them out anyway. So. And the home the home builders can have their signs out for the weekend for the new developments. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping Marla from the HBA was still here but no, it looks like left. she left. left. Yeah. Um. This is, again, this is only public right away. Okay. So no to everything or modi mo take out the- Or modify condition. Mo modify it. Yeah, I think that's the, that's kind of the, the piece. It's, it's the sign, so. Um, it, here's another option, because I don't, I, I know where I want to go with this, and I don't know where everybody else would want to agree with me on this. Um, and Troy mentioned kind of a piece of this. Could we vote on the co the zoning ordinance itself, mm -hmm. minus the sign thing, but then take a separate action or separate motion on just a sign thing? Can we do that? Do you know what or I'm saying? Or to postpone mm -hmm. the yeah. sign. And that, that's not a bad idea because that would make it cleaner. That way, w when you get to the sign part of it, you could make multiple motions if one failed and then you could figure out the particular reason it failed. I don't want the zoning motion. to fail because of the sign thing. Does that yeah. make sense? I think, I think that's, you could, you could certainly make that motion for just mm -hmm. everything in Title 17 except for the, uh, uh, the sign signs code. in the right of way. Idea. Signs in the right of way. Okay. And then address that out right after. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the motion to approve uh, the zoning ordinance on second reading um, items one through seven, nine, and ten, and we will vote on eight separately. Is that, can we do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's my motion. Ms. Estes. Second. Discussion. Motion? Oh, go ahead. I would like a, a date on this and when we're going to bring it back. I just really right don't want to. Oh, okay. We can do that right now. That's soon we? enough. <laughs> yeah, no, that was my, that was my. I, I so it doesn't hold up everything else, just specific to the signs. Yeah. Okay, is that okay with everybody? Let me, so if I need to modify that, we can, but I would like to just do it right now. If we it's already okay. did that. So. Okay, so we have a motion and second uh, for items one through seven, nine and 10 on the zoning ordinance. Please vote. Seven yes, motion carried. Okay, <coughs> now uh, back to the sign issue. Um, so at, at, I guess the, do we want to allow the signs in right away based on the, the new verbiage um, or do we just not want to allow it at all? I think those are the two main points, right? Mm -hmm. We just do away with the extensions and let them have the weekends. <coughs> Do we need to take a break? I agree. If you're gonna go that okay, let's take a five minute break. We're taking a five minute break. You guys took too long. Okay. 
I'm good with no sign. I, I know that the police... Mm -hmm.
Somebody's not going to be fair. <laughs> I know. You, you can't always be fair with everything to everybody. It's just. That only works for Bernie Sanders. Okay, thank you. Oh, we're waiting for Miss Dietra. What's that? Oh, we're Miss Kern, uh, Miss yeah. Joni, Miss Joni. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, did you guys need to clear any, clarify anything? Nope, we're okay. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to reiterate one more time. Uh, we either just remove the right of way. Or just remove it totally, so no signs in right away, or um, at the moment, this addition of the revocable right away sign permit applicant may apply for one extended period, revocable per calendar year. Um, so that portion. Um, Friday through Monday. Correct. Oh yeah, yes. So there's a third option. So mm -hmm. thanks for throwing that monkey wrench in. Okay, um, I will take a motion. Mr. Lauer. I moved that we would not allow any signs in the public right of ways at all. Okay, Mr. Geek. I second that one. Mm. Okay, we have a motion and second um, to not allow. Uh, Can we address this some other time later in the future, depending on how this works out? Yeah, you're the legis you're the yeah. you're the legislative body. You can you okay. can change it how, right. whenever you want. This so this could be changed. Okay, if we need to. Okay, all right. Uh, vote. Six yes, one no. Councilmember Thompson voting no. Motion carried. Okay, do you want to say anything? Yeah, anybody who's mad, call me. Well, we'll revisit it, right? Because I have the right to do that as a person who lost. I can do it in six months or something like that. Uh, the time frame I would have to look into. I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. I don't know the time frame, but yes, there is a time yes. frame. There is a time frame. It can be brought brought up. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, I just, yeah, I have concerns about freedom of speech and taking it completely away. But I understand it is only in the right of way. So if you're upset about it, you for right now, uh, send me your comments. And um, then um, we can look at it, figure out what the time is, and maybe work at it a little bit more. Can I, you know, it's a, it's a living law, right? It can be revisited. And um, um, I lost my train of thought. It can um, be revisited. It can, my train of thought too, yeah. Okay. It can be revisited. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item nine, new business. Uh, no items were removed for consent agenda, so we'll I move on to nine. Whew. Move on to item 9B. I'm opening a public hearing and first reading of ordinance number 1745, an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city of Fountain from the planned, U planned industrial PI district to regional commercial RC district for property sometimes known as South Park Technological Center located at 7159 and 7219 Banley Drive, Fountain, Colorado and here and after more specifically described in exhibits A and B. Ms. Martinez. Thank you. Again, this item is for the South Park Te Technological Center rezone. It's located north of Highway 16 on the east side of Banley. So this is the Highway 16 at 132 exit at I-25. Loves is on the corner. This property is located just north of that interchange. The property is currently zoned the planned industrial <coughs> zone district, and they are requesting a rezone to the regional commercial district for approximately five acres. There are two parcels, 7159 and 7219 Banley Drive. <coughs> the northernmost parcel is currently vacant, and then the southern parcel has the RV storage warehouse that has no um, utility services to that location at this time. The surrounding area is consistent with the rezone. This area has um, materially changed and has in how it in how it has developed over the years is to more commercial rather than an industrial. Um, this is also an emphasis on the city's entryway and corridor, and it's um, advantageous to have much more commercial rather than um, heavy industrial zoning along our entryways. The zoning exhibit, again, just to show the two parcels in question. Uh, this is the location of the parcel with the um, RV storage, and then this is vacant. 
The Comprehensive Development Plan Future Land Use Plan recommends business park and industrial for this area. Uh, the request is not consistent with the Future Land Use Plan. However, we would be supportive uh, of the deviation since there has been a material change in the area and how it has developed. Staff finds that the request is consistent with review criteria two and three outlined in the zoning ordinance. This item was presented before Planning Commission at the December meeting with an affirmative vote of seven to zero. Therefore, staff would also recommend approval uh, tonight of Ordinance 1745 on first reading. Is there any questions for staff? Uh, that, that one might work. I'll try to show a little bit further out. So down at the bottom off of this image is the Highway 16 interchange, so it's on the north side. And Banley Drive runs along here. This is the trail that cr uh, goes over Fountain Creek. Oh, that's a trail? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's drawn like a road. <laughs> it's, yeah. It was a former road that's been vacated. Um, that's where I was confused. On the east side of Banley. The north side of of, of this, yes, of the yeah. interchange. Uh, there's a metal storage building with RVs right here, and then this is vacant. Right. Okay. That's further north. And the applicant is here if you have any questions for him or if you would like to present anything to council. Now where was that? Okay. Uh, did the uh, applicant have anything they want to say or are you just going to wait? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for Christy or applicant at this point? Mm -mm. Okay, uh, it is a public hearing. Does any public want to get up and speak on this item? Okay. Seeing none, any further discussion from council? If not, I'll close the public hearing. And uh, unless further discussion, what would council like to do? Uh, Ms. Estes. I move to approve ordinance number 1745 on first reading. Okay, and Mr. Geek? Second. Okay, we have a motion and second for approval. Uh, please vote. Seven yes, motion carried. Okay. Thank you. Um, item 9C, resolution 20-004, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Fountain, Colorado, approving contract modification order number three for the Duckwood Road Crossing and CNS Road Project to Keywit Infrastructure um, Co. Ms. Williams. Mayor and Council, Brandy Williams, City Engineer. Um, I am bringing the final contract modification order for the Duckwood Road Project. Thank you, those of you who are able to attend the ribbon cutting, and hopefully everyone's had a chance to drive it by now. Um, if you have any questions or comments, I'm here. If not, this was just everything we had to wrap up to get it done. Make sure that we had a turn lane at CNS. We closed Mesa, which I think went smoother than I anticipated, so that was good. You did a good job. Thank you. Uh, very nice. I, I actually had the opportunity to drive State Representative Lois Landgraf down here for a meeting one day, and I said, we're early, and I drove her through the roundabout, and she was absolutely thrilled. She thought it was fantastic, with the much safer, with the turning lanes in both directions, and she said, hats off to you guys. Thank you. So. Okay. Um, no questions from anybody? Mm -mm. Okay. Seeing none, uh, what would council like to do? Uh, Mr. Geek. Make a motion to approve resol resolution 20-004 on first reading. Uh, and Ms. Duncan? I second. Okay. Uh, please vote. Mr. Applicate, I need your vote, please. Seven yes, motion carried. Okay. Item 9D, resolution number 20-005. A resolution authorizing the award of a construction management general contractor CMGC contract between the City of Fountain and Daniel Berry Construction Inc. for the remodel of fire station number two, construction services. Chief Maxson. Good evening. 
Uh, before you, you do have the contract for the remodel for Fire Station 2. Fire Station 2 was built in 1982 as a volunteer fire station. Uh, this uh, remodel will add uh, 1,206 uh, square feet of new bunk room space. We'll have separate bunk rooms for the male and female firefighters, and we're remodeling 1,260 square feet of exist existing space into a day room and also remodeling the kitchen that was originally built, like I said, in 1982. Uh, we will also be uh, putting an automatic fire sprinkler system in the building, which is required by modern day building code. Um, with, and we also are doing our own demolition uh, because we do have tools for that uh, to save uh, the taxpayers a little bit of money. Also, the city is doing a, uh, a lot of its own utility work to try to save money there as well. I stand for any questions that you may have. It, it is good. It is. <laughs> okay, I have no questions. Um, this, I think there's a way, way overdue, uh, this remodel, and uh, it'll help with kind of everything we've been fighting for for the fire department, especially in that area, and uh, being able to provide um, better services, including an ambulance. Um, and uh, we already have this one manned, and, and we can continue to, to man that. And, and uh, you know, the, the big discussion at someone even, was it tonight or some other time, that, yeah, we could build a new fire station somewhere, but we still can't man it. So um, at least this one, it's already manned, and, and the improvements I think are going to help with response times and everything else and, and uh, just give us more stuff to do there. So um, Much more nice for the people who live here. Oh, much nicer. It would be a huge improvement. And just because we have the need to keep it staffed while it's under construction, we do have two fifth wheels of crews will be living in for six months because that was the fastest way to get this completed is get them out of the way, still utilize the truck bays, and they'll live in those fifth wheels during the construction so we can get this taken care of. Yeah. Okay. Keep All the right. station open. Um, any questions? Uh, Ms. Thompson? I know one of the issues at this station was also with the, um, when they pulled up when they start the trucks up and when they bring them back in the exhaust, is that going to be addressed also? So with this station, we actually do have the uh, correct um, exhaust system with the hoses. It's actually a different, uh, our station one is the only station without those exhaust hoses okay. currently. But this station is, is well equipped with that. Okay. So, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, Ms. Duncan. I don't have a question. I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we approve um, this for the fire station. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Applegate? Second. We have a motion and second for approval. Please vote. Thank you. Mr. Applegate, I need your vote, please. <laughs> Seven yes. Button. Motion carried. I keep getting turning off the other button and thinking <laughs> that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, Item <laughs> 10, correspondence, <laughs> comments, and extra fiscal reports. We'll start with city manager, Mr. Trainer, uh, Mr. Evans, glad you're back and your yeah. wings getting on the mend. Doing really good over here at this point of the night. Good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> good. I keep bumping him too, that's. Um, uh, Mr. City Attorney. I've said plenty tonight. Yeah, you did. <laughs> 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 Chief Maxson, anything further? If you only had a vote. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Chief Heber. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, uh, thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, Rick Clemens, I was able to see him do a brief on the rec center today. Came and briefed at the CTC meeting. Rick did a great job. Highly motivated. Uh, really represented the city good and got some donations. Uh, so that's good. Um, our SRO contract, you proved on consent agenda, a reworking the SRO contract. We, we, and we looked at an entire contract, top to bottom. Um, we found out the school district was probably paying about 60% the contract we all agreed based on the time the SROs in the school is going to be 73 so with them choosing to do two additional full-time positions it'll be a, a net to the city of about 140 grand uh, which is going into it fully paid by the school district so that's very good for the safety of our kids and the value there which is good um, legislature season is in full swing there's a lot of bills that law enforcement is very concerned about uh, this year that will impact the way we do operations and then resources so we're keeping our uh, eyes on that the red flag law <coughs> is in effect. I'll just tell you that everybody in our region has taken that bill very seriously in the impacts to include the judges, uh, Chief Judge Bain, it's only himself and three judges, only three, so four judges total that are gonna look at all those 
uh, different affidavits and requests for red flag laws, make sure they make a high standard of proof, make sure we get around uh, some of the fears that somebody's ex or it's a revenge type of thing, uh, et cetera. Um, I have strong feelings on the, both the Constitution and obviously guns. Anyone knows me my, knows my stance on guns. Personally, however, comma, we run a police department. We're going to follow the law. We're going to do it very humanely, very compassionately. Um, so there's a lot of effort and synchronization uh, in the region to do that. I just wanted to have you all prepped with that information. Should you get questions or have you have further concerns, uh, I, you're welcome to come meet with me, my staff. Troy will be involved in the consultation. Should we get a red flag law order, it'll come directly to me. Um, uh, and then I'll sit down with my staff and legal and we'll figure out the best way to do it. Um, the last thing I'll just highlight is we're going to be at uh, Paso County Health is going to do a very, very large uh, suicide task force. Um, they looked at a lot of military communities that have a far less density than we do. Uh, we have a very high military density and there was no comprehensive suicide task force. So this Friday we're going to attend their first meeting. Uh, I was very honored to be asked to do some of the opening comments from that. It's a very passionate topic. I think uh, first responders, Todd would know, uh, military personnel, uh, obviously. Uh, we're 22 a day in our region, and uh, I think there's going to be about 600 folks this Friday that attend that. Uh, we want to make an effort on suicide uh, to include children uh, in our region because it's very high. Um, so that's good. There's a lot of people there. There's a lot of energy behind it. So I feel very fortunate for that. Um, welcome back. Godspeed. Let's have a good 2020. Thank you. All right. Um, John. Okay. Uh, Ms. Williams, anything else? Ms. Martinez? I spoke enough today. Okay. <laughs> It's been it's been kind of your show lately. It's it's uh yeah. <laughs> uh, anything from IT? You guys good? Wonderful. Um, just kind of get it on the radar. Uh, the 18th of February, 18th. Um, we're looking at. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. No one's even responding. The 18th of February. I think we're looking at doing a workshop for broadband. Um, so uh, it'll be here. Okay. All the discussions uh, or the discussions will be all around the different options and and how we want to possibly move forward with it. So, uh, okay, I did want to mention that um, uh, both our senior city clerk, uh, Ms. Huffman, and our city attorney, which I think probably why he felt like he had a little bit more latitude tonight, it's both their birthday today, so um, uh, <laughs> supposedly she's watching on YouTube, which I don't, uh, I don't buy for a minute, but I uh, uh, just want to wish them a happy birthday and, and and thanks everything that you guys do for, for our city, and, and we're glad that you're here, um, especially on your birthday. So sorry. Um, uh, with that, I'll start with Ms. Dean, uh, Ms. Duncan. Anything? I'm just super excited. I want to re reiterate our uh, Martin Luther King Jr. program on this Monday at 1 o'clock, 1.30, 1.30, 2.30. We don't plan to keep you here all day. Um, it's going to be at the Fountain YMCA, uh, 326 West Alabama Avenue, right here in Fountain. Uh, a special shout out to our sponsors, uh, the YMCA and the Pikes Peak Diversity Council, and Jim Flowers with our Fountain Valley Chamber of Commerce. Just to clarify, the time, one or one, what, what is it's the time? It's 1.30 to 2.30. 1.30 to 2.30 at the Y though. Mm -hmm. 326 West Alabama Avenue. The Y is taking that over. Oh, the new Y. Okay, the new Y built. Thank you for the Defect okay. Fountain Valley YMC. And I would have been in the wrong place and. Yeah, Defect okay. stands for you know Dean Flesh Hour. I know, I'm familiar with Defect, yeah, but when she said Y, my brain went over to. Oh, yeah, no, I'm just saying that for everybody else. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Geek, anything? There's, I went to a meeting last night as far as the recreation center is concerned, and they're in the process of getting a 501C. Yes. And so donations can start coming in for the preparation. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so that's get that's moving forward. The recreation center and the donations and all that stuff is in the process. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Mr. Applegate. No, right now. Is that just anything? Airport town. Nothing for me. Uh, Ms. Thompson? Yeah, I think I misspoke and said if you're upset about the new sign law, contact me. No, contact them. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. 
It will be a short conversation. I, it's just, it's, it's too, too much. And it's not limiting free speech. I don't have a call, call me. Yeah, you can call me. It's, it's, it's not limiting free speech. It's. Um, you want it changed? Anyway, to call me. <laughs> uh, I have nothing tonight. Uh, our next meeting will be January twenty eighth. Um, we are adjourned.